Hi, welcome to construction site management and inspections. This is lecture seven. We're gonna be also using, utilizing material from chapter eight of the textbook. And today's topic is job site labor relations and control. So we're gonna be looking at some of the factor, factors that affect labor productivity, uh, which are numerous. Um, some of the hidden factors, as well as some of the not so obvious and other types of factors. We'll also be talking about typical hierarchies of reporting requirements of labor within a project, a uh, bit of discussion on labor agreements and hiring practices and evaluation. We'll talk a little bit about evaluations of employees and evaluations of subcontractors and um, how a reporting system and cost control system work. So these are the topics that we'll run through in today's class. So labor, of course, is our craftspeople. And we've talked about, you know, what's a craftsperson, somebody that's a licensed trade uh, that uh, has excelled in their particular area of work and they specialize. And they are typically, there are the people that we employ if we self-perform the work. And then there's the people that we contract the work out to. Now, we don't have direct control as a site super or manager on site over employees of a subcontractor. But we definitely have influence over that subcontractor who we've contracted with. But our own employees, we do have that, that control. We, they, we manage those particular people. We pay those particular people directly. Um, so um, that's kind of how that works. Now, as I said, we don't have direct control. We have indirect control over the subcontractor that's performing the work if it's a sub. And we've already kind of established that too. Contractors in Toronto tend to self-perform a much smaller amount, like in a big urban center, a, a New York, a Toronto, a Vancouver, a much smaller amount of people than um, in a smaller town. Maybe in a smaller town, they self-perform a lot more because they can, they can be more productive, they can be more competitive in that niche area. So that's a variable that depends on the company. So a contractor usually employs a bunch of different uh, trades. Usually you'll find with the laborers, uh, carpenters being the predominant um, trade areas that you'll see form workers, concrete finishers, depending what it is uh, in those particular cases and depending what you define those roles. Usually a GC not, not, um, does not have their own electricians and plumbers unless it's a mechanical contractor and now they are taking on the GC role in this particular project, which to be quite honest, that's happening more and more. Just imagine you're, you're a, a big mechanical contractor and in most buildings, mechanical contract, like a building systems take up about 40 to 50% of the cost of the building, if not more. So if you're a large mechanical contractor and maybe you've even in some cases purchased an electrical subcontracting company so now you handle electrical plumbing hvac there's an opportunity there for you to become a gc why be a subcontractor maybe there's certain projects where the predominance of work is in that area then you can sub out to those other trades so there's all kinds of mixes that come in here is my point uh, so it's hard for me to just say one i think you got to have an open mind to it traditional sure it's a GC, they have their own labors, maybe carpenters do some work, maybe not even that much, as I said, maybe just to do the gap work that it's kind of between trades, that sort of thing. Uh, and that would be your own employees. So labor productivity, however, it is a big deal in construction. And even if it's not your own people, even the subcontractors, because you wanna monitor, are they gonna get this work done in the time period allotted? So we do have to monitor that and we find different ways that we measure productivity rates. We can measure productivity rates by the linear foot installed, by the square meter installed, by the cubic meter installed. So there's different ways or metrics of measuring productivity. And we can look at that and we can have a, a good idea if, you know, if a thousand bricks are being laid a day and we've got 100,000 bricks to do, should take 100 days. 
And if that was the plan, a hundred, a thousand a day, a hundred days, well, if we're monitoring the work and we see that only 500 bricks are getting laid, then we should be asking the question, well, how long is that going to take? Well, if we had a thousand bricks was going to take a hundred days, 500 bricks is going to take 200 days. We got a problem there, right? So then it becomes, well, do we have enough resources on this or are we not working as efficiently as possible? If it's a subcontractor, you're going to be really wanting to push for them to get more um, trades there so that that can go faster. If it's your own forces, you're going to definitely want to look at, well, why is this not going the way we estimated it? Why? What's what's hindering our processes? And you want to do uh, a first run study to try to look at what's going on and figure out exactly how you can rectify it now before it gets to be too expensive. Uh, of course, when we also think about being productive, well, if we have changes that are occurring, that in, interrupts our flow of work. And in construction, we really want to try to have a continuous flow of work. And so if we keep getting interrupted and stopped and we have to deal with changes or worse yet, like this staircase rework where you got to excavate this out because somebody didn't lay it out right with the doorway, didn't make it wide enough and had to add an extra footing onto the side of it. Why? <laughs> right? Why? So we definitely want to minimize rework and to be honest, minimize changes as much as possible. Uh, changes are not the gold mine that everybody thinks they are uh, in construction. Big changes usually are pretty good. Like, you know, a client decides I want to add this extra addition onto the side of the building. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's pretty good. But if it's like 30 different changes that are $200 each, it's not good. It's interrupting the work. It's all the admin costs. They don't want to pay the amount of the admin costs because they don't think they're getting the value out of it. And usually those things end up in claims and then it's usually pennies on the dollar and so it's a, it's a level of frustration. So you definitely want to um, uh, try to be investigative as possible so you don't have unforeseen conditions appear. You want to have as few errors as possible and you want to try to organize your processes so you can handle changes really well. You want to track them really well and you want to be able to calculate their costs and be able to um, walk your clients through so you can build trust with them what those particular costs are. We also, uh, when we think about productivity, can be interrupted with productivity pretty badly with weather, right? Uh, what's the weather going to be like? Well, we kind of know in December, January, February, March, you're going to have bad weather. So you make some allocations, hopefully when you estimated the project, so that you can handle that bad weather when it appears. But let's face it, some years you get more bad weather than other years. So you do want to also track it. There's things that you can do. You can have a weather schedule in your schedule and you can track the bad weather days. And if it makes the project take longer, you can get an extension. Uh, not necessarily extra money for it. Uh, the client didn't cause the bad weather, so they don't nece necessarily owe you for the bad weather. But you definitely don't want to pay liquidated damages when you had an excessively bad weather year. So, because you didn't cause the bad weather either. So you definitely want to monitor that, but you also want to understand that when you're calculating timing and things of that nature, you want to have uh, the conditions set up that it's easy to work in. You want to have proper protective clothing. If you have to hoard something in and heat it to protect it while it's being constructed, that all has to be part and parcel of the planning and costing process. You also want to make sure that you don't waste materials unnecessarily and that um, they're fully utilized and that things are not thrown out unnecessarily. I may have mentioned this in a previous video, but uh, for sure I probably did because it, it makes me think a lot. And uh, one of the um, more uh, well-known home builders, uh, Peter Gilgan from Madame Homes, I was, I was told by one of the senior uh, VPs uh, at one point, you know, he looks at things a little bit differently. He'll see pieces of, uh, of lumber on the ground and he'll say, well, that's a loaf of bread. Or he might see a few bricks on the ground and he'll say, that's um, a liter of milk. And you know what? I think that's a really good way of looking at things. Sometimes you just see this, oh, it's just a pile of garbage. Who cares? You start thinking, well, that could have fed somebody. You know, that's waste. That really is waste. We could do better. And thinking about things differently. I think that's, I think that's a way of thinking to be successful. 
So it's sometimes worth when you hear somebody that's pretty um, successful and they say something and it seems to make resonate with you. It's, it's worth remembering those things. And really, if you're creating a company, wouldn't you want everybody in your company to kind of walk around and have that sort of mentality, the way that they think about things, and you're bound to reduce waste. You create a culture that does that. And so um, that can be a very positive impact on any business from that perspective. And construction, as we've mentioned in a previous lecture, there is a lot of waste and a lot of room for improvement. So lean construction, which is all about eliminating or reducing waste, defines waste in eight areas. And all of these really impact productivity in one way, shape, or form or another. Um, defects, as I've mentioned. Waiting for materials. So if you've got a crew of people and there's supposed to be a delivery and it doesn't come, they're waiting, all right? Or they're in the schedule, both trades were supposed to finish on this particular date so the next trade could start and they've mobilized to start and one of the trades is behind and now they can't start. So they're waiting. That is waste, right? Transportation of goods, how we transport, transport our goods to the site. Do we transfer them too early and then it's in our way? Do we transport it too late and then we're waiting for it? Uh, if we transport it early, do we move it to get it out of the way? Do we damage it when we move it? Does somebody steal it? You know, there's a lot of things that go into transportation of goods and uh, waste. Wasted motion. Brick lane's a good one. So, you know, is everything set up to reduce the amount of motion? Are the brick masons trained to be efficient in motion? Have they greatly reduced their impact on motion? Really, you can sort of think about this stuff as a nice, even flow of motion. And um, uh, that the better you are at that, the smoother you are at that without creating overburden. Overburden is where you are overburdened. You're like rushing. And when you rush, you make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, you're back to rework and defects and all those other things that aren't good. Inventory. Well, how much do we need? Of something because once we get it we have to pay for it that affects cash flow so try to having in lean construction we try to have material arriving to the site at the most responsible time so we don't want to have tons of it arriving early we want to have it arriving to the site at the most responsible time uh, and it goes back to transportation of goods and waiting so they interact with each other these eight types of waste I'm overproduction. That's doing something more than you have to do it. Like that's finishing it more than is necessary or required. Sometimes we go overboard with certain things and they're going to be covered up. So why are we doing it? Um, unnecessary process steps. We kind of, I think a good one example is that is the submittal process, that flow chart we looked at earlier uh, in the course. And if you look at the submittal process, it's in one of the earlier lectures, there's a lot of steps in there. Can we use a particular productivity software that maybe reduces or eliminates even one of those steps that makes it easier for us to do, that's helping us. So un taking unnecessary steps uh, is waste. An incorrect use of talent or underutilized talent. So you have some very smart people in your team. Have you got them engaged? Are you, are you, are you finding out what their ideas are? And that is very important to be successful in construction. I think Jack Welsh once said, uh, when he first got hired as the head of GE, um, one of the frontline workers said, Jack, I've worked with my hands for 25 years for GE. They never once asked me to work with my head. What did I know? What, what could I help? How could I help? And he went away thinking, what a waste, right? Um, so incorrect use of talent or underutilized talent. Sometimes the quiet person is the smartest one in the room. So make sure that you pick their, their brain. Um, High labor turnover. That may be an indication of poor planning, uh, general unrest, lack of leadership, inconsistent training, incorrect labor employed. I uh, recently had a, a meeting with a bunch of people from the Mechanical Contractors Association who I do a fair bit of uh, work with. And um, one of the biggest concerns is to make sure 
that their people are properly trained, like their managers are properly trained in the soft skills. So they're, they're, they want to ensure that you don't have a, a foreman or a site super who is turning off your people and making your best people want to go to your competitors. That makes no business sense. No business sense. The days of somebody screaming and yelling and thinking they're getting a great result because the person jumped and did it are gone. They might jump and do it that one time. And in the meantime, they're looking for a job somewhere else because they don't like being treated like that, right? That is a humongous waste of talent. And that is a big demotivator for your crews. So you definitely want to be able to engage people properly. And there's a lot in the soft skills and the management skills that are involved in being successful at the foreman level and at the site super level and at any level where you're engaging with people. Uh, a point was brought up at the meeting that, you know, before somebody gets up to another level, we got to make sure that they're not going to wreck a relationship with a consultant, wreck a relationship with a contractor, wreck a relationship with their employees because this costs us in a big way. So this is the way companies think, and it's a good way to think, right? Uh, and it's an important way to think because you're playing the long game, not the short game, when you train your people effectively and you have consistent training and there's a culture in the business of what's expected. Um, job accidents and unsafe conditions are another uh, area. Again, if people feel that you do not have their backs with regards to safety, then this company doesn't care about me. Why should I care about this company? So, and of course, there's the things that I think I mentioned in the last lecture about uh, safety. There's the Occupational Health and Safety Act for regulations. You must comply with the Occupational Health and Act, Safety Act and regulations. And that's the minimum, right? And then there, a lot of companies are acting above and beyond what the minimum requirements are. And again, it's a culture, it's ethics, and it does tie to cost. You'll pay less in WSIB premiums. You'll have safer sites, less interruptions, less in fines. The brand will have a more positive view than a negative view. So there's a lot of advantages um, there. Uh, working overtime. Uh, that's another thing that you have to think about. When you are working overtime, you are usually working overtime because of um, falling behind in your project. And if you're falling behind in your project, you're trying to catch up. So you're rushing things and people are tired. When you work overtime, you are not at your best. There's a lot of statistics that show how the productivity rate drops the more overtime that you work. Think about yourself. I know myself, if I have a day where I've got like seven hours in the daytime and then I have three hours teaching at night, by the time I'm teaching that three hours at night, I, I'm not clear. I, it's, it's, I'm not as good as I normally am. And that has an impact. Uh, same thing on site. You can imagine with trades and tools and equipment, uh, the site uh, can be less safe. So these are things that, that come into play. Of course, there's also the cost impacts of working overtime as well. So if you're going to design a project that's got a very short time sp span, you got to look at, well, for a short period, sure, overtime can work. For a longer period of time, you got to start thinking about second shifts. You got to be thinking about um, maybe different trade contractors. So somebody's not doing pulling all the work. There's different different mechanisms for doing that. Projects in existing facilities or congested areas. Again, more people. Uh, Brooks Law, adding more people to an already late project may only make it later. That's Brooks Law. Adding more people to an already late project may only make it later. And that's got to do with physical constraints, right? So if you've got too many people in a small area, that's going to be a problem. It can make it more dangerous and it can make it um, slow down. We call that stacking of the trades or stacking of the work. So you, most projects follow some sort of histogram similar to this. There's when you mobilize, you start up, work ramps up, and then you get into full sort of speed with it. And the amount of people and trades that you have on a site tends to level off somewhat. It can be up and down, but level off somewhat. And then towards the end of the project, as trades finish up and leave and demobilize, it fades down. 
So it really kind of follows this um, sort of S curve. It doesn't have to, like if you fall behind on a project and the finish date doesn't change, then this stacking tends to get up higher over here because you've moved some of the work from here to over there because you've fallen behind, right? That causes stacking and you've got to replan the logistics of the site and a whole bunch of other things. So that's a consideration as um, well. And it, call, it forms what we call an S-curve. So these numbers quite simply are um, these numbers that are occurring every month, like 250, uh, what do I got there? 250, 300, uh, 350, right? Work days per month. And then this is the cumulative. So this would be 250 plus 300, 550. 550 plus 350, 900, and so forth. And that's the cumulative. And the cumulative forms an S-curve that looks sort of like that. Sort of that ramping up and then that tapering off that, that occurs. And that's the stack effect. If you fall behind and things get pushed up, that's um, stacking. We also have to review schedules to make sure we haven't expected to do too much in a short period of time. So the superintendent who's at oversees the project, if it's a big project, they may have a super a senior superintendent and then they may have area superintendents. Area meaning, okay, you're doing the east wing, you're doing the west wing, you're doing the overall hospital. Uh, so that could be set up like that. And then they would have their own reporting structure under them, subcontract. This is one box, but it could be 30 different boxes, right? Under all the individual subcontractors. Field engineer, that's, we tend to call it a project coordinator, so same idea. Uh, labor, assist, really like a, a coordinator and assistant to the assistant superintendent, if you will. Labor foreman. The labor foreman is what we call the last planner in lean construction. So that's really like, they're like a, they can be a working manager or they're just a foreman that's looking after their crews. They come from the trade, they know the trade, and they're the one that's closest to the work that's involved in the management of the crews that are doing the work. And so they call them the last planner because you should be making sure you are picking their brains of what they're capable of doing in a week. They know their people better than anybody. Um, it's like in the military. The general doesn't know the individuals in the platoon, right? So you have to be reliant on whoever's your first level manager. Uh, for that and that's the labor foreman and very often they're un they've been in the past underutilized I think there's this large light that's gone on in the last 10 years what's also tricky for them is though they've taken on a much larger role with the aspect of planning and uh, managing the time frames of the work to be done and that's um, that's a pretty heavy toll that they've been taking over the last few years so um, that's a, just a little feedback anecdotal feedback I give you on that Labor agreements in, uh, basically that we run into are between contractor and unions. And if it's a union, uh, it, it's going to put in the framework of what you can do, what you can't do, what overtime they will work, what overtime they won't work. So it paints the box within what you're working with, with the labor agreements. Um, and you may have some latitude to negotiate something a little bit like a local agreement negotiation for a particular project etc but these are what the drivers are that you work with within so you need to know what those agreements um, allow you to do and don't allow you to do when i first started uh teaching actually not teaching but yeah teaching it's a union job i've never been in a union job i was more used to private sector and i was used to managing projects and managing people and hiring people and so I didn't really look too much at the agreements from a teacher's point of view, even though it has a lot of stuff. Well, then I got to be uh, chair and acting director. You better know what the agreement is. I got, because I found there were faculty that knew that thing inside out and upside down and backwards. So I had to learn it inside out, upside down and backwards. So I could know what was true and what wasn't true and um, very important to do. So that comes into the labor agreement side of things otherwise you could have a you know big grievances being filed against you for things that you did that you shouldn't have been doing because the agreement is basically the contract with the workers uh, so yeah the, the superintendent contractors job site representative right so when we think about control of labor 
you're the you're the on-site representative the pm is not the on-site representative that would be your jurisdiction uh controls the cost time and quality of the direct work that's going on uh, pm does control costs from the sense of here's the budget amounts and here's uh, the procurements and, and all that but what how well it's actually going on site that's the site super's job right that's that's their job that's get the flow of work going on the site and oversee the subcontractor you're really of the work the physical work that's going in the project that is the role of the superintendent right um, not so much the what's going on between the client and uh your the gc more the work that's going on that we have to do physically to get this project done. So uh, the foreman, as I was mentioning earlier with that org chart, they're really the, the last planner, all right? And it says job is to push the work. Lean thinking is that you wanna have the work pulled instead of pushed. You want, you want basically the, um, the next part of the job saying we need this, we need this, pulling the work instead of everybody sort of push, 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 push. But traditional thinking is push. So we'll, we'll understand that push is the job of the foreman that's directly linked with the frontline tradespeople, right? That's why they're the last planner. They're the last link to the actual hammer hitting the nail. And they really do understand the technical work if they're a good foreman, they really do. They're the eyes, ears, and superintendent spokesperson. So that means the superintendent has to have a really good relate working, build good working relationships with their own foreman and with the subcontractor's foreman. Um, so also, as we said, authorization over time, um, some of the activities that get involved with that, that come up, that comes into it. Employee relations. Uh, I was mentioning that that's an important part, building those relationships and understanding and where somebody needs training and if there's apprenticeship training programs and knowing who's going when and that sort of thing, uh, that would definitely be working with the superintendent on those aspects. It might be an HR department on a bigger company that might be handling some of that, but uh, definitely a superintendent has to know because they have to know who's going where, when, and coordinating that because somebody has to fill the gaps when they're gone. When we talk about evaluation, I'm going to bring this back up in the project closeout section, but I thought, seeing we're talking about evaluation, it's good to know how people do. And so subcontractors can be evaluated on the work that they're doing. And so a subcontractor, uh, uh, this is an evaluation form that I've got for GCs to evaluate a subcontractor on how well they did their work and whether we want them to work for us again. And if they do, what kind of effort it's going to take from us. So there's sort of levels. This is a subcontractor we'd never want to work for us again. This is a subcontractor that we'd love to have work for us again. Um, this is one that when they see a problem, they come to us with the problem and they already have it solved. That's a really good subcontractor. This one will see the problem and advise us on it, but probably doesn't have it solved yet. This one could be an excellent subcontractor, just needs a little bit of work and guidance. And this one, if we're going to hire them, we better be sure that they're low enough price that this makes sense, because it's going to probably cost us a lot more time and effort to manage them. It's kind of Pareto's law, 2080 rule. This sub is going to take 80% um, of our time. Hopefully they're not more than 20% of our subs. Hopefully they're only like 10% of our subs. And rate the foreman. Sometimes it's a good sub, but a lousy foreman. If the foreman's no good, that can affect the whole project, as we just mentioned, going back to the foreman, right? It's a big, important role that they play. So if they're not very good, we don't, on the next project, maybe that subcontractor, we don't want that particular foreman. Well, when we have a pre-award meeting, we can have that discussion with them because we haven't awarded the contract yet. They're also the site super is responsible for the tools that are used on the project, uh, which tools are used when, and uh, making sure that they're available and making sure that they're delivered in advance of when we need them. We also uh, have to keep labor recording records um, for the project, and we'll, we'll follow up on this a little bit later, but it really gets into cost control, control and monitoring in third year uh, typical courses uh, where we look at um, 
the uh, hours of work, where you're working, and assign it to budgets so that we know how our budgets are doing on the particular areas of work. We can provide feedback to estimating. So we want to track that. And usually that tracking is done with a productivity software like a Bluebeam, uh, a Procore, or one of those tools that you have your trades enter the data directly into it. And so that they have it so that then it can be managed in cost reports and included for payroll approvals, hours of work, etc. So we want to make sure people are working the hours supposed to be working, if there's overtime, that we're paying the overtime, and that it's documented and that it's assigned to the right budgets. So in summary, there's a lot of lot encompassing uh, labor and um, ensuring that we have the right people on the right positions and enough quantity of them and that they're engaged and motivated enough to do the work. Those are like four or five bullets, but they're really four or five courses. <laughs> and it's a lifetime of work to really get those elements um, down. Uh, but it is, as you notice in your different things that you learn in construction, there's all these little nodes of information, then you start to wire them together and then it becomes a much more clear picture. So hopefully that's given you a good uh, overview of um, construction site management productivity and um, costs and labor management. Uh, we'll be talking about much more in those in coming uh, lectures. So for now, I'd just like to wish everybody a, a wonderful evening and a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time. Tom Stevenson signing off.